Paula, thank you so much for being with me here today. And I really look forward to asking you lots of questions. And I know that you are very multidisciplinary. Oh, that's a bit of a tongue twister. You do art on lots of different multidisciplines. You are an illustrator, you paint, you draw. Um, you run this platform called Where Are The Girl Brands, which we are mainly talking about today, which I have lots of questions about. And you make all this amazing art on for, for the Instagram page for this platform. And um, yeah, I think there's so much that we can talk about. So I'm really happy, happy to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we swap to our drawings? Of course. Thank you, first of all, for that very kind introduction. That was lovely. I'm so excited to be on the podcast. It's such a lovely format, having the making and the talking. So I'm really looking forward to it too. Um, yeah, I'm Ella. I'm a fine artist by education and I'm also a freelance illustrator and writer. I co-run Where Are The Girl Bands along with my friend Eve Machin and the platform was set up in 2018 as a place for women in music to find support, to be platformed, to network and to have conversations about removing barriers to access to the arts. Mm -hmm. So I do loads of different little bits outside of girl bands, but um, it'll be really nice to talk about that today. Yeah, fantastic. Um, um, I'm really so curious about how it all got started. Because for me, um, yeah, music and um, like visual arts are quite separate. Like I am absolutely not musical at all. Uh, and I love listening to music, but I, I'm a little bit of a noob. I don't really know that much about what, what's happening currently. <laughs> and um, yeah, that transition from doing visual arts to uh, doing music and working with musicians, that's really interesting. The, I'll, I'll quickly turn my camera around and then before, otherwise I'll forget and then uh, we'll really dive into this. So we have a little bit of an inspiration picture here, which you can see on screen. And um, this is uh, Minerva Daisy. She is an artist or they are an artist from uh, Manchester, really sort of active in the Manchester, Liverpool area. Absolutely amazing. She does a bit of sort of gender bending on stage. Her music is really upbeat and really happy. So I'll just make sure that I mention that before we get started. And the photographer for this photo, I just quickly wrote it down, is Sips Studio. So I will put all of that in the show notes. So I want to make sure I give them proper credits for credits are due. And um, so this is our inspiration piece for today. And I picked the photos because it's so colorful and fun and I thought it'd be a lot of fun to draw and also maybe a little bit easier than a full sort of face portrait so we can add lots of flowers to it. Um, so uh, yeah, are you drawing with me today as well? I am, yes. I've got um, my pens ready, I've got my sketchbook and it'll be nice to do some traditional drawing today because as we were saying before we started I'm quite used to working in a digital format for the girl band stuff so it's nice to go back to basics. Okay fantastic um I think doing sketching and drawing whilst talking is a little bit of a challenge um so I, I'd like to challenge my guests um and I hope you enjoy that as well so if yeah. you need to think about your answer you get distracted by your words <laughs> fine that happens all the time just so you know them. So, so I'll just make sure that everything is working. Or that I have checked that already three times. Yeah, there we go. Um, so how, what's, what is your sort of artistic journey looked like so far? Because um, I know you went to art school, didn't you? Yeah. So, I mean, I think like most artists, I've always just been drawing. Um, since I was a baby, I was just drawing and drawing and drawing my whole life. And so it felt like a very natural step for me to have an arts education. It was kind of the only option for my whole life. It was always felt kind of predestined. And I did a degree in fine art at Manchester School of Art. And my practice actually is quite conceptual. It's quite different to the illustrative work that I do. I do a lot of mark making as a sort of therapeutic process, sort of repetitive mark making. And that's again been something that's been with me my whole life I've always turned to drawing as a way to heal as a way to process just as something that's almost like a form of meditation to me mm -hmm. so it's something that's always with me and it's very natural to me and the illustration side of my life and my creative practice has also come quite naturally because again it's just something that I've always sort of done and it came into the girl band stuff very naturally too we started off because myself and Eve, who run the platform, were in a band together in 2018 when we started the platform. Um, and basically, we just didn't know where we fit into the local scene. We had a lot of questions about accessibility, about 
diversity in the local scene and we basically wanted to form a platform where we could have those conversations and meet other musicians and other creatives and when we started the platform we thought that a nice sort of unique thing that we could do to engage people with the platform including musicians and just other people who maybe wouldn't usually engage with a platform like ours was to have hand-drawn illustrations as kind of like a bit of a unique selling point. Mm-hmm. So from the very beginning of the platform, I've done illustrations of the musicians that we've worked with. Mm-hmm. And it's just still kind of blossomed from there. I think we developed quite a unique visual language for mm-hmm. the brand, which has definitely helped us with collaborations and being visible online. And for me as well, it's kind of opened my career to freelance illustration as well from the visibility that I've got from working with girl bands. Yeah, I can really see how that happened because the um, the uh, the illustration style we are the girl bands is so clear and it's really distinct. So I can imagine that if you have that on posters and on social media and you share that, and everyone loves having their picture drawn, don't they? So it's a really good way of you know engaging with people. And uh, yeah, I can see how that really has opened some doors because it's really stunning. Uh, yeah, visual language, I think. Um, and what you said about how um, art is almost meditative, that is something that really resonates with me because I started making some musings as a platform to teach mindfulness and art and just to show people you don't need to be a professional artist to get those benefits from drawing. So that's something that I really recognize. It's, it can be so relaxing to draw, and sometimes a bit frustrating, but most of the time, really, really relaxing. Um, and with we are the girl brands. You sort of it started to as female representation, but it's really grown to more than that, isn't it? It's like I know you do a lot of like black artist representation and visibility and like inclusion all over. Definitely. I mean, for us, we began the platform, I guess, from the perspective of feeling like our local music industry was very male dominated. And mm-hmm. um, it definitely is within the music industry as a whole. There's lots of statistics that have come out recently which just show how low numbers are of women in the charts, women in production roles, women behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So it's still very much central to our aims, dealing with gender disparity in the music industry. But of course, women have all different eclectic ranges of experiences. Um, And so it's really important to us that the page is inclusive and it deals with all different barriers to access to the music industry and the arts as a whole. So Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely as the page has evolved, We've made sure that we're not just speaking about women's issues, but also about issues around homophobia, transphobia, racism, and ensuring that the page is platforming marginalised voices rather than just speaking about our own experiences. And yeah, and it's even just opened up across discipline as well. Like we started off focusing on musicians, but within a music scene, there are writers, there's photographers there's visual artists, there's people of all different creative disciplines who are involved in those spaces. So, yeah, the page has definitely sort of evolved and opened up as we've been working on it. The, um, yeah, I, I can certainly see how that happened. And the I don't, I've never really come across another platform like yours, so I think that's really fantastic. Um, and you organise live events now as well, don't you? Or is that in collaboration with different organisations? Yeah, so we've done quite a few live events. It was something um, that actually really came into fruition when we were in lockdown and looking forward to the future. So we got a lot more time really to think about how we wanted to evolve the project and the different ways that we could use the platform and the network that we'd built to, I guess, improve or open up the local scene and really bring to life the ideas that people had spoken about in our sort of discussion spaces. So we partnered with a local venue called the Bloom Building in Birkenhead, and they're a fantastic organisation who house different charities, but specifically Open Door Charity, which is a mental health charity who provides various different workshops, um, therapy, all different kind of fantastic resources. And they invited us to have a year-long residency of events when we opened up back into live music spaces again. Mm -hmm. And it was just a fantastic opportunity for us because we had quite a few months to have community consultations, speak to our audience about what they were worried about with the return to live music, about any issues they've had in the past with gig spaces. 
and basically visualising alternative ways to see live music. So that manifested in quite a lot of different ways. We had one of my favourite events was a more sort of mindful approach to music where it was rather than people standing with a drink and being, you know, in a crowd where it's really loud, there's loads of music, there's big strobe lights. We really toned it down and we had beanbags on the floor. Everyone was just sat down, chilling. It was a sober space. We had a meditation to start off the live performances and it all felt very intimate and very calm. And it was definitely a really helpful way to reintegrate into those live spaces when there was so much anxiety about returning to those sort of social social spaces and the social anxieties that come with those social spaces. And we had all sorts, really. We had workshops, we had themed events. And um, ever since then, we've done tons of different live events, partnering with other local organisations. There were loads in Liverpool who really focus on accessibility and on platforming a diverse range of people. So we've been really lucky, really, in being able to have hand in a ton of different live events. I think it's interesting because for musicians, the whole lockdown must have been so intense. I think for me as an illustrator, as an artist, being at home is sort of part of my normal practice. So lockdown happens and it was all really scary and, you know, intense. But the part of working from home was sort of something I was doing already and um, I did start to teach all my classes online and stuff but it was very um sort of it felt quite natural but I think if you're a musician and you're used to going out and I know how that was for you as being in events but the fact that that suddenly was not possible and then opening again and going out again and then having like it's such a big difference isn't it being in a busy venue compared to being from home like how was that for you personally it, I mean it was definitely definitely a big change I think you know lockdown and the pandemic was I'm sure very traumatic for lots of people and for me there were lots of personal tragedies in my life at that time and you know it was all very frightening very overwhelming very difficult which I think really is why I threw myself so much into girl bands because it was something that made me feel connected to other people and um, it was a very isolated time of my life and having this community online of different creatives was just an amazing support system, really. Mm-hmm. So we really tried during lockdown to make different spaces where musicians, like you say, who are so dependent on like the gig economy of live music events, trying to find support for them, different routes for financial support and also just collaboration and networking. Like we held these Sunday social events every Sunday over Zoom, which were really nice where creators could drop in and have a chat and speak about collaborations. And it's also when we started working more on radio and podcast formats. Hmm. And we did a few panel discussions with creatives and really just invested as much time as we could into making sure that musicians and creatives had support from us and backing from us at a time when they were really stripped from their livelihood in the communities that they were part of. The um, I think that's awesome, and also the the um, of bringing people together. So so often, I think creatives view each other as you know competitors, but it's really nice to be more on the collaborative side and think, oh, actually, what can we learn from each other, and how can we help each other, and how can we work together? And uh, I think that is really lovely because, um, yeah, the one big happy family sort of feeling. I love that. <laughs> definitely I feel like the Liverpool music scene is like that anyway and most sort of grassroots creative scenes are because you know obviously there is so much pressure like you say on success and about how to find success and when there are few financial avenues really for success or for longevity within the arts it does feel very competitive but there's such a vibrant culture in Liverpool of raising each other up and giving each other opportunities and making success within grassroots spaces, which is something that we're really passionate about. Where are the girl bands? We think that success comes in all different shapes and forms and nurturing your practice with other creatives is as much success as finding fame, for example, might be for a musician because there's nothing more beneficial in life really than feeling like you're growing and evolving as a creative with other people who you care about. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. How are you getting on with your drawing? <laughs> it's hard to talk and draw at the same time. Yeah, I'm making kind of slow process. I've gone through a sort of 
I'm focusing on my eyes, so I'm doing like a few little flower eyes so far, which is quite fun. And um, it's a really good reference picture. It's so so nice having all the different flowers, like you were saying. Yes, isn't it? So I'm I'm basically doodling. I started with a bit of a plan, and then I grab a marker and I'm just doodling. But I'm I'm quite liking it. It's a bit of mixed media, um, in wildness. So, um, when you what what instrument do you play in the band, or do you sing? What do you do? Yeah, um, so I was a vocalist. I also play guitar, but yeah, I was mainly a vocalist. I've kind of stopped doing music weirdly since doing girl bands. I think my relationship to music has turned into a much more facilitator based position where I'm much more interested in supporting and elevating other musicians and their music journey than my own. I think I'm much more naturally aligned with visual arts so the time that I have because we run girl bands on a voluntary basis all of my sort of spare time really goes into making all of these different visual and written formats. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I, I do think it's interesting how your relationship to art forms can change over time and how um, like a different art form can sort of take over for a little while and it can be different again in five years time or in ten years time you don't know but it's it's interesting how that goes and do you do you still manage to make art for fun as well, or is it all work nowadays? Oh, definitely. And I'm, I'm really passionate about poetry as well. Um, poetry is kind of swept in over the past year, like you say. Sometimes different art forms just kind of take over, and poetry definitely took over the reins for me for a bit last year. And um, but yeah, making is just something which is really important to me. Like I was saying before, it's. It's a really important coping mechanism in my life. It's something which has always been my go-to if I'm overwhelmed or if I've got a lot on my plate. Just sketching, doodling, mark making is just, it's like a necessity for me. So it's always there. It's always present in my life whenever I've got a spare moment. And really as much as, you know, where the girl bands is for other people and it is, you know, work with deadlines and all these sort of things. It's still really fun. I still love, you know, making the illustrations and working on the visual identity of different projects. It's something that, yeah, I really, really enjoy. Mm. And do you do you work? Do you prefer working um, sort of from your own ideas, or do you like it better when you have a brief and you work on someone else's ideas? I think both. Both are really nice. I mean, I'm definitely someone who can just have a million ideas at once, like. At any time, I've got probably 50 ideas on the back then of things I'd really like to do if I had the time. Um, so if you let me loose to just make whatever I want, I'll definitely be making something. Um, but I definitely do really like working to a brief as well. And I think working with musicians is really interesting too. Even just like this reference image that we've got today, musicians often have really clear visual identities that they associate with their music and they've got such specific brands and even just within their music I often have very clear visual themes in their lyrics and it's quite easy really I think to build sort of a visual collaboration with people in the music industry they're often very vocal and very clear about what they want mm -hmm. and with our very specific color palette as well it's a quite nice basis to form a collaboration because when I've got those colours and, you know, our sort of limelight style ready to go, I can kind of adapt it and format it with whatever someone's ideas are. Mm. So I've really, really enjoyed the collaborative process of working with Grow the Girl Bands. Mm. That's really interesting. I think for me, I'm a very much a visual person. And um, I really like the sort of playfulness of art. And like today I'm just seeing what happens without any pressure. And sometimes I have a really clear idea beforehand and then I work from that. And I love working from a brief when people, you know, give me ideas. But I'm not very good with words. So when you say poetry, I find that really hard to writing things down. And um, music is also something that I struggle with. So for me, it's really visual is, is, uh, is my, uh, my tool. So the fact that you have all of these things, that is really interesting. Yeah, I think I've kind of always been a cross-discipline person. Um, like you were saying before, I find that I kind of just get taken over by different disciplines. Like it's not even really like a choice. Sometimes I just sort of find myself falling into doing lots of writing. Sometimes I'm really focused on my mark making practice, and sometimes I'm really invested in more illustrative work. It just feels quite natural that 
different ebbs and flows, I guess, have come into different formats. But yeah, I don't know really. I think I was definitely encouraged growing up to express myself in lots of different ways. I had quite a, a turbulent upbringing, really, quite a difficult childhood. And I think I just looked for as many different healthy coping mechanisms as I could find when I was growing up. So I definitely found that when I was a young carer growing up, so I think an experience of lots of young carers is that it's quite difficult to find space to navigate your own feelings if you're looking after someone else. And as a child, harboring, you know, complex emotions is quite difficult. So I just sort of was like expressing (laughs) out in as many different formats as I possibly could. And I'm quite grateful for that now as an adult because I definitely feel like I can sort of turn my hand to lots of different disciplines and I'm definitely more comfortable in some than others like as much as I love music I wouldn't really describe myself as a musician anymore like I definitely um would not be as confident like I've played a lot of gigs when I was growing up and I was in bands and wrote a lot of music but I don't feel particularly confident in that area and I feel like I would need more time to like rehome my I guess my skills in that area whereas I always feel like with visual art it's just completely natural to me and with writing as well it's something that again I sort of come to as a coping mechanism so it feels very natural for me um and really yeah like almost a companion in my life I'd say. Hmm. Um, I'm sorry to hear that your childhood was difficult and I'm really glad to hear that you find solace in art and that you find that and it's a way to deal with things so thank you for sharing that um yeah I think that that's the way art is for a lot of people and as I think the um you don't always need to be like a master in something or you don't always have to be a professional in something to really enjoy it and yeah just to to love it and you don't even have to do it yourself to really enjoy it is it like you can go to a museum and love looking at beautiful art without having to make it and you can listen to music without actually having to do it so there's so many different components to that as well and yeah, I think that's, that's that's great. Um, what's um, what are your sort of? Do you have any immediate plans sort of for the future with with where the girl brands or are there things that you guys are working on or on um, yeah, things that you're thinking about sort of what it could be like in the near future, in the far future. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're always working on lots of stuff at once. It's kind of lots of plate spinning kind of organisation. Um, we've got our ongoing residency at Melodic Distraction, which is a Liverpool-based radio station. And that's always super exciting, working on the radio show. We get to chat to lots of different musicians, lots of different artists. And it's just a really fulfilling platform for us, really. And it's ongoing. So each month we have a new different radio show and we're kind of always working on that, doing lots of different interviews mm-hmm. here and there. And we also, along with that, have a residency in their magazine. So we're working on lots of different resources, lots of different articles, long form features and interviews. So that's really exciting and something which will be ongoing into the future. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of other projects and goals, we're definitely looking to venture back into live events. We've sort of had A bit of a hiatus, our last event that we did was in December. So we've got some plans and some ideas for future live events and some other things which are more collaborative and so have to remain more secretive, unfortunately, um, because of the people involved. Yeah, it's good. It sounds like there's lots of exciting things happening. um, Your radio station is called Safe Spaces, isn't it? Yeah, so we have we have a podcast called the Safe Spaces Podcast, which was in collaboration with a local CIC called Compt Youth, and that was specifically based around conversations to do with safety within the local sort of city region of Merseyside, and also within creative spaces as a whole. Mm-hmm. So that podcast is available to listen on Spotify. It's really interesting we spoke to a real eclectic range of people from organizations to local sort of activists individuals creatives about what safety means to them and what they think needs to be done to make creative spaces safer and then we also have our monthly show on melodic destruction radio which is much more general in its theme so it sort of changes month to month our show is called the where the girl bands catch up Mm -hmm. so we basically just catch up with musicians 
talk about what's been going on in the local scene, different things that are coming up that people should look out for, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've got a few different radio projects going on. No, that's fantastic. Um, you'll need to make sure that you send me all the details. I think I can find them all in the links from um, from your Instagram account, can I? But um, yeah, if I'll, I'll, send them there, I'll put them all yeah. in the show notes and uh, make sure I share them all there. My uh, my drawing is becoming more and more wild. <laughs> <laughs> the colours are gorgeous. I love the palette that you chose. It. I recently started to work more with um, oil pastels again, and I used to use mm. them as a child. But then at some point, I wanted to make more like precise drawing so I started to use more colored pencils and more like mm -hmm. fine, finer sort of materials and then recently I thought oh I have this box of oil crayons so you can see they're so I didn't keep them very well I just put them all in one back and they become really grubby <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's such a uh, it's a really nice material for when you just want to let go of perfectionism and mm -hmm. the texture what's um what are your favorite art materials to work with Oh, so my probably my favorite art material is pen. I love working with pen. Mm -hmm. Specifically, these pilot pens are something which um, they were like my dad's staple pen that he stood by when I was growing up. So I've kind of stood by them as well. Um, and I use them for my mark making practice. And I also use them for illustration work. So often, I have a bit of a hybrid approach, so I'll sort of draw something out traditionally with pen and then scan it in and add colour or refine um, on Procreate. And I also do a lot of digital work recently, but I think pen and just drawing, putting, putting pen on paper, the simplicity of it, how it's just immediate, is something which always really appeals to me. Mm. It's just really quick and simple and it feels like such a direct translation of like, myself onto the paper like I just put the pen down and make a line and then move on it just feels nice and simple and clean um yeah yeah I totally agree with that I draw quite a lot with ballpoint pen and mm -hmm. it's just such an underrated art material and it's really lovely because you have always you know you can really find one really cheap or you have one on you when you're yeah. or something you don't need to have any other materials and it's just uh oh yeah I love drawing in pen but I, yes I draw a lot in ballpoint pen and I have so um, this is a brush pen that I use quite a lot as well. Um, but the marks are quite uh, bold and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, not very precise, which is nice as well. So I use that sometimes. But the uh, yeah, I think ink drawings and pen drawings are uh, in its simplicity. If you have like, these really nice lines, it's like oh yeah, it gives me a lot of joy when I look at those. <laughs> like, yeah. So. It's, actually, I forgot to ask you. This was this is supposed to be the first question I ask everyone, but I have forgotten every single guest so far. Um, <laughs> so the question is because my um, my name is Makings and Musings, and Makings is the the doer, the, the making things mm -hmm. and Musings is the thinker, the dreamer. Would, would you say you're more of a maker or more of a muser? Ooh. I think I'm definitely a bit of both. I definitely am a muser. I think I get very carried away in ideas of possible things. And I'm a big daydreamer, um, a big overthinker as well. So in good and bad ways. Um, but at the same time, I think I do tend to put pen to paper. Like I was just saying before, I think I don't spend very long in my head before I sort of put those thoughts down somewhere. I find thoughts quite heavy to hold. So they always sort of end up written down in some format, whether that's like in a creative project or in journaling. I'm a big journaler. I just write and write and write. Um, so, yeah, I think probably actually I lean more towards the making because my musings sort of go direct, straight, immediate pathway into the making. Oh, I love that. The, um, oh, I'd be so cute. I, I know you're... Your journal is probably really private and just for you. I'm, amazing, I'm imagining that it's this amazing space with some poetry and some thoughts on the paper, maybe a little doodle here and there. And yeah, pretty much. Yeah, okay, so, you're world famous. This will be in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mom. My mom absolutely loves reading like collections of letters and diaries of artists and writers. So 
ever since I was very young, she was always like, you need to keep a diary, like you need to practice journaling and have all of your notes written down. And I write lots of letters as well. I write letters to my friends and to my family. So I'm sure um, there is a very large, hefty collection of my inner working scattered <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> Um, I think I love letter writing. I have a few of my friends that I write letters with since I was a child. Um, and not not as regular as I would like. Sometimes there's months or yeah, between two letters. But I just think having a physical letter and the fact that someone receiving a letter is just such a gift. It's so lovely to have something that someone really put the effort in to take a pen and write it down. And um, yeah, it gives me so much joy. And I really hope that people especially young people nowadays, um, if you grow up with Twitter and like quick you know, messages and stuff, I just hope that people still do letter writing in like 20 years' time or 50 years' time because it's so valuable. Definitely. It's just, it's a very different process as well because like you say, texting is so immediate and it's so reactive because it's this back and forth conversation, whereas there's something very deep and reflective and intimate, I think, about letter writing mm-hmm. because... It's just you and you're writing with intention, usually for quite a long period of time for someone. And then you have to really sit down with the letter they send you and dedicate that time to them as well. So it feels like a very thoughtful and, yeah, a much more slowed down format of connection, which is really lovely. It is, isn't it? For people who get overwhelmed by social media, go back into letter writing. I really recommend it. Definitely. (laughs) It's a really good way of connecting to people. So when you receive a letter from someone, do you open it immediately and read it or do you save it until you have time with a cup of tea? (laughs) Well, it kind of depends who the letter's from. I think if it's from a friend who, like you said before, sometimes I'm not expecting a letter or it's been like a while between receiving a letter and I just can't help myself and I have to tear it open and read it straight away. But if it's a letter from my mum, my mum writes pages and pages of letters she writes probably like 25 page letters so I really need to dedicate like a serious <laughs> a serious chunk of time to those oh, 25 pages that is that is commitment I don't think I've ever yeah. written a letter that is <laughs> me neither maybe maybe like 10 tops <laughs> 10, yeah. 10 sites that's it to say not a Maybe not pages. But yeah, I don't think uh, I've ever written a letter that long. It's a serious commitment. Yeah. Um, my mum has really small handwriting as well. So if she writes me, it's always like, lots of information on the paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. There we go. I'm just trying to make everything sort of connected together a bit more because it was a bit mm-hmm. messy but I am I am enjoying it. Yes, I did say um to Venerva that um if she comes out really wonky in her portrait that she should have <laughs> person she said she was absolutely fine with that. <laughs> so um, no pressure to create things that are super lightly. Yeah, I've kind of gone with the more sort of surreal approach. I've really fixated on the sort of flower glasses. Mm-hmm. There's something about the eye in the middle of the flower which really appeals to me. So that's kind of just become a bit of a repeated motif for me today, which is quite nice. It's nice when you have a reference and there's something that sort of pops out. So I really liked her tattoo. So I put some fishes here and there sort of to mm-hmm. let her come back. The, um... So have you ever done this before where you did a podcast and drawing at the same time? Well, funnily enough, actually, a few years ago, I it wasn't a podcast, but I hosted a workshop called Drawing and Talking. So kind of similar, actually, weirdly, in terms of its concept. And the idea of that was basically to have a space where people could connect with each other if they were struggling with social anxiety and um, it's definitely something that I've struggled with through my life and I always think it's nice in social situations if you have something that you can sort of zone into if you start feeling overwhelmed or if there's a silence that you don't know how to fill 
you've got sort of a socially acceptable reason for why you're being quiet and why you're maybe focused and zoned into something else. Mm. So I held a sort of mark making workshop where people were invited to come and talk or not talk. Um, and that was really lovely. So it's it's a nice sort of full circle moment for me being on this podcast today because it's nice to be on, I guess, the receiving end of the, the hosting space. Um, and yeah, I've not done anything like this for, for many years. That was in about 2019, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so quite a while ago. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a lovely concept. I think it's so nice to have that collaborative feeling of, you know, both of us drawing from the same source image. And it's just, yeah, like a nice thing to zone in and out of the conversation and with the piece of work that you're making. Good, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I am, and I do agree. I think when you're in a meeting or something, or I used to work in a very corporate job and I used to have a lot of really boring meetings. (laughs) Um, And then when you're doodling, people just assume that you are sort of making notes or you can sort of do that and then focus on that and not worry too much about what's going on while still listening. And I think that's really nice way of doing things sometimes so yeah yeah or in school like there's there's really i think that when you have social anxiety i think it can really help to um yeah to do that um for me personally i don't i don't know if i really have social anxiety but i definitely struggle with like really intense spaces so a few years ago i would go to nightclubs I wouldn't do that anymore. But like a festival outside where there's fresh air and lots of space, I can deal with that. But really dingy places ah, where it's really busy and all the noise is too intense. Um, it's just not for me. <laughs> yeah. So I think you do get to know your own limitations a bit better when you get older. And then um, it's easier to say no to certain events when you think, ah, I think that's fun, but I won't enjoy it actually in reality. <laughs> Definitely. I think that, if anything, was a positive to come out of the pandemic because I think people were able to really reassess the spaces that they wanted to be in Mm -hmm. and the things that they felt comfortable with and even just for us as event facilitators it was really nice to have that time to reflect and feed back to other promoters and other venues about different ways that you can make nightlife spaces feel more comfortable because like Mm -hmm. you say often they are really overwhelming really crowded and there's no reason why events have to be like that just because they're at night. Like th- there's no reason why we have to stick to those traditions of really loud, noisy, yeah. like substances everywhere. Like, and obviously there's a place for that. Like those things are really fun, and you know there's no reasons why that yeah, should be like banned. But just having alternatives is is really really important. Yeah, I agree. The um, what's what is your sort of ideal Saturday night look like? Do you like to go out or are you more of an indoors? I'm definitely definitely more indoors these days. I think I did a lot of going out when I was younger and now I much prefer a quieter experience. I still like, you know, I quite like going to like a pub or something like that where it's more conversational Mm -hmm. um, and it feels more sort of like you're engaging with people um, and you can also sit down, which is nice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very explorative. I like going to different type of alternative events. I really appreciate that. I find that really exciting. Um, even things like art events, like even art events, I really enjoy. Um, like private views or sort of alternative mm. film screenings. So I'd say my favorite sort of Saturday night definitely would be doing something novel. Mm. So going to an event that's not like an event that I've been to before. That's kind of my dream. My mm. dream evening. Oh, perfect. The, um, I I don't know Liverpool very well, um, mm-hmm. and uh, I've been there a few times sort of in the past, and it always surprised me a bit about how life here is. Because in in the Netherlands we have like a few big cities like Amsterdam and Rotterdam. I'm from the Netherlands originally. We have Amsterdam and Rotterdam, and then there's like everything else is significantly smaller. <laughs> and I, I guess you have that a little bit with London here as well, but. Yeah, I didn't expect Liverpool to be so buzzing and uh, yeah, it was much bigger than I expected and much more lively. Yeah. yeah, it definitely is a lively city. I think you've got historically, obviously, a very musical route um, and there's just a lot of culture really that happens in Liverpool and there's a lot of community and lots of different people, I think, who are quite passionate about making 
new and fun spaces, which definitely helps, I think, with the vibrancy of Liverpool because there are loads of people out there who dedicate their spare time on a voluntary basis to making community spaces, making live music spaces, and people really engage in them. So it's definitely a great city to be a part of if you are creative or you're someone who wants to, yeah, like find new places and new evenings out, I guess, to go to. I think sometimes it's also good to live in a slightly smaller city where these places are a little bit easier to find. I think when you're new to London, it can be really overwhelming because there's so much to be found. And whenever you go somewhere, you never run into the same person twice. <laughs> there's always new people. It's like, yeah, it's quite nice to go to a place where it feels a little bit more local. I, um, I missed that when I first moved here. Yeah, I think Liverpool for me, I think obviously probably because I grew up there, but there is almost like a village feeling to Liverpool where everyone does sort of know each other. And I think also just people are very inviting and people are very welcoming in Liverpool. Um, If you're new to the city, there's not only organisations who are going to reach out to you and, you know, give you loads of resources and guides to different places where you can get stuff uninvolved. But if you go to any kind of event, there will always be someone just in the crowd who will take you under their wing. It's such a friendly and embracing place. And because of that, it sort of feels it feels quite small and quite welcoming and a bit less overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I do I do agree with you. I think sometimes having that slower pace is nice. I've actually just moved to Bath from Liverpool, so it's a very big change. Um geographically, like I've moved down to the southwest, but it feels a much slower rhythm of life here, which I never thought that I would enjoy. I've always perceived myself as sort of like a city girl who's like in the vibrant action. But actually, I really enjoy just having sort of slow, leisurely walks around the cobbled stones. <laughs> uh, I'm exactly the same. So I moved from London um, to a town called St. Um about mm-hmm. two years ago. Um, and it's much quieter. It's quite close to London, but it's much, much quieter. And there's like fields with cows around, and it's really, uh, yeah, it's very calm. And um, mm-hmm. I still, I tell people I live in London when they are not from England because no one has heard of this town. <laughs> but it's, and I, I would never have thought that I wanted to move out of the city. I always thought I want to be like, to theaters and music and lots of events and. But actually, I have not really missed it. And um, whenever I want to go back, it's just quite easy to go for a night out and then take a yeah. little bit home or a uh, hotel. <laughs> it's quite easy. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually really loving that. And I think that's something that, for me, came out of sort of the pandemic as well, that to enjoy a bit more time, a bit more quiet time and a bit more uh, time at home as well. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, I am not really, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not really a minimalist when I'm drawing. I just take lots of stuff on the paper. It's a bit of a maximalist. Um, the, um, so do you work from home then most days or are you, um, do you go to a studio or where, how does your, what does your work day look like? Yeah, mainly from home. So at the moment, because I've just relocated, I'm just doing a little bit of freelance work and sort of looking for something a bit more permanent mm-hmm. job-wise. Um, previously, though, before moving here, I was working actually as a youth worker. So that was quite different to a sort of stay-at-home day-to-day. Mm-hmm. That was very much in person, in community spaces, in the office. So I've gone from quite like a, quite a hectic, I absolutely loved it. I'm so passionate about youth work and um, community engaged practices, but it's definitely been nice to have, yeah, some some time at home to just mm-hmm. sort of refocus and think about my next step. So mm-hmm. yeah, at the moment, I'm very much at home and um, settling into my new, my new rhythm of life. Oh, interesting. The, um... As as a youth worker, does that mean you go into people's homes to speak to people? Or what do I imagine? So, I mean, that is definitely the case for some youth workers, but I was part of a CIC which hosted workshop spaces 
and different sort of youth work support spaces within an office in the centre of um, Liverpool. And yeah, so I used to run programmes of events. So I used to programme around safe spaces, actually. So upskilling young people to understand what safety meant for them and to help them produce live events. So we did some art exhibitions. We did some live music events, some poetry performances. Um, and yeah, so I do weekly workshops as well as more drop-in spaces with young people. And absolutely loved it. I'm really, really passionate about youth work. Um, it's definitely something that I want to get back more heavily involved with. But it's definitely, it's definitely a big job. It's a big job emotionally and responsibility wise. Yeah, I understand. It's it's really interesting because you have like so many different things that you are doing at the same time, and a lot of different interests. And but there there is a big sort of overarching theme, which is the safe spaces and. And yeah, the inclusion, and it's really interesting to see how that sort of comes back in so many different parts of your of your life and your work, uh, your work life. So it's really interesting. I love hearing them. Yeah, it's definitely something which I'm aware of, and it's funny, like you say, how I guess eclectic the different mm-hmm. projects and the different areas of my life are, but they do always seem to join in the middle around community and safety and accessibility I think mm-hmm. my my ethics or my passion is so rooted in that feeling of community and inclusion that it just sort of naturally spills into anything <laughs> that I'm doing whatever medium or sort of environment that I'm placed in. Mm. And do you find that when you do um, illustration commissions that that also that it, that is also a feeling that these type of organizations find you for these things or is it is it a very different yeah do you do different things there yeah I mean I'm definitely open to more diverse forms of illustration I think you know I'm always open to following a brief or working more commercially but I think because of the path that I've sort of made for myself I do end up working more for those sort of community-led organizations and I think my illustration style as well sort of leans into that feeling anyway because it's quite soft um, and I think the sort of organisations that it appeals to are usually those community focused more third sector charity um, type organisations. The um, Are the illustrations for We Are The Girl Brands very typical for the type of illustrations that you make otherwise or um, you developed a specific style for them? Yeah I mean I definitely work in different formats as well, I think. Um, I, I'm always obviously open to adapting my portfolio. Definitely veers away from just the sort of tra- traditional line work, which I do for Word Girl Bands. Mm-hmm. You know, I've worked within paint, within collage, and definitely within more sort of ab- abstract applications of illustration. But I think my personal, I guess, brand of illustration that people reach out to me for tends to be that more stripped back line work based sort of soft um illustration that the girl bands page sort of looks like Mm. um, do you find that having gone to um, art school and have done fine art there that that's what how how much do you think that has formed your your career like i'm I'm self-taught so i don't really have that um that background so I think it's funny really because I feel like my illustration practice in the more commercial and more financially supported areas of my life as a creative are really kind of nothing to do with art school. They're things that I was doing when I was a teenager and really not much has changed in the way that I approach illustration. Mm-hmm. Fine art, at least within university, is a very practical course. There's not you know much teaching really even in in a sort of business business terms there is very little that's sort of provided to you in terms of understanding commissioning setting yourself up professionally there was very very little that we were sort of equipped with in university I think what it did give me was time and space to think about the ethos I guess of the work that I make and the conceptual leanings of the stuff that I make the theory around the work that I make and 
my fine art practice definitely flourished through the fine art course, as you probably would expect. Mm. But I'd say actually the illustration work that I do, the commercial work that I do, I could have done definitely without having had a degree. It really, yeah, I think, you know, if you're someone who a degree doesn't appeal to, then you definitely don't need it for a creative career. It's really not like my fine art degree is not that appealing <laughs> necessarily to you know people who want to hire me for more commercial visual work it's you know if anything it's probably less appealing than someone who doesn't have that on their cv so I think you know it's all it's something that's very valuable valuable to me and I wouldn't give it up because I definitely developed a lot as a person my fine art practice is very important to me um but yeah I don't think it's necessary at all and I think mm-hmm. Yeah, you can do so much outside of outside of the university space, and so many people that I work with and that I know have absolutely flourished in their own pathways that were nothing to do with the university. Hmm. Interesting. The um, I well, I I can't afford to go to art school now because studying in England is so expensive. <laughs> but the um, sometimes I do think, oh, it'd be really nice to be in a space where there's lots of art materials and you can really experiment with them and just work really large as well to be in this studio space where um, you can see this is my studio, it's quite small. Like if I want to have a really big canvas and just throw art, like paint at it, um, that is quite hard to do unless I'm maybe in the garden or something. One of my, I, I will do that at some point, but it's, yeah, I need to find some space for that. So things like that, that, um, yeah, where it allows you to experiment with things like that. If you might not want to buy all the materials for at home, that's fantastic. And you'd also think that it would teach you a bit more about the business side of running your own business. But I've heard from a lot of people that that's not actually the case. Yeah, definitely from my experience and the experiences of other people I know who've been to art school, there's very little just teaching as a whole really I think there's so much space like you were saying for experimentation for development you have access to a lot of really amazing resources so even things like artist talks and Hmm. the introduction to you know local art scenes is invaluable in many ways but yeah there was very very little understanding of the business side of things or even just in terms of a career how to pitch yourself how to fulfill briefs how to apply for funding there was really nothing within my education that equipped me with those tools it's all things that I found or I've had to self-teach or look elsewhere for educational resources the um yeah things like funding are so fundamental for a lot yeah. of our practice, especially if you want to like, open studio space and things like that. And you know that the Arts Council has lots of funding available for lots of different things. But if you don't know about it, and you don't know what the requirements are or how to go about it, or even um, it can be really daunting. So it would be really nice to have some classes on like, how do you approach a brief like that? Like, what do you put in? What, what sort of information are these organizations looking for? Or how much detail of information? Or, yeah, I think, but um, that is something that maybe art schools should consider a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's listening. <laughs> yeah. So, how um how are you getting on with your with your drawing? And am I am I forgetting anything? Is there anything you want to tell us that uh, I have not asked you yet? I don't think so. Really, I think it's been it's been a really in- interesting conversation, and you've definitely made me think about some things that I've not really articulated before. Um, my drawings, my drawings going quite well. I'm just starting colouring in. It's lots of little flowery, flowery eyes. Um, I send over photographs that it's a bit clearer, but yeah, it's been nice. I've just been sort of doodling quite naturally as we've been talking, which is quite nice. I feel like you say before when I was in school and I'd just be scribbling away <laughs> in the back of my exercise books. Yeah, I love that. You can almost make a pattern out of that. Like we're like a like a jumper mm-hmm. with lots of these eyes. I love it. Yeah. The um um also apparently when you make someone do something with their hands, like knit or draw or make something, and then you fire questions at them, um, people are more likely to give like honest answers. 
So you might try some things, lose that um, that people don't, don't want to give up yet, some, some secrets. So uh, this is why I do it. This is my real yeah. reason. I 100% agree with that I think that drawing really does unlock the subconscious in some way Um, it's why I draw as sort of a therapeutic process because I feel like it often unlocks honesty for me like it helps me understand like where I'm at and what my thoughts are really trying to say yeah absolutely and also when you have a bit of art block which I know all artists have sometimes when you've got days and it just doesn't come, it doesn't work, flow. Um, if you just get started with something, then usually within not too long, some ideas are still popping up and you think, oh, actually, this will work. Does that work for you? But this is usually what happens when I start drawing. It doesn't mean you know what it is, you're just copying something and then the idea is sort of. Definitely. Even if I hate what I've done, usually it makes me realize what I want to do instead. I'm like, no, I'd much rather be doing that. So it's always good, I think, just getting started is the hardest part sometimes, isn't it, with making, just having the confidence to get going and put pen down, especially if you're something like starting a new sketchbook is always just so daunting. Like I've got a brand new sketchbook, which I've been waiting to crack open for probably about two weeks now, but I've still not quite found the confidence to mark that first blank page. Yeah, all about just getting started. Do you start on the first page in your sketchbook or do you skip that and then go back to it later? It tends to, it tends to just always stay blank. There, It's just every sketchbook I've ever had just has one empty page to begin. Yeah. I think there's something about not starting on the first page that makes it a little bit less pressured. Yeah. Okay, that first page is supposed to look awesome because you open the book and you want to see it. <laughs> so you can do that later and then uh, it may or may not happen. I, yeah. I, recommend that and do you do you have sketchbook for specific themes or you just work on one sketchbook yeah so I'm I'm quite specific with my with my books um I have lots of different books I've got several here like I've got one journal for one thing like there's two more I've got one that I'm working in now like <laughs> I'm very um segmented with the different things that go in different books so yeah sometimes they cross over naturally but I tend to like keep poetry in one space and then journaling in another space and fine art stuff in one space and illustration stuff in another space I always start like that but then I always happen to be you know on the train and I don't have the right sketchbook with me and I want to do yeah it wasn't supposed to be in that sketchbook but <laughs> yeah they always sort of mix up in the end anyway um, yeah. but I do have a few sort of mixed media watercolor sketchbooks that I use for mm. wet mediums and then lots of cheaper ones for um, pen drawings and like finer sketches and stuff like that that yeah. are not wet so I think I'm almost finished I'm just adding in a little bit of black here and there Amazing. Slightly chaotic drawing. I added these eyes were white for a long time, and then I added in a bit of an eye shape, and it was really intense. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really intense look. I quite like yeah. it. Your your drawing has a sort of Ophelia feeling to it going on. It's all this fire, these shapes around it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And like the sort of the the, the position and yeah, it's gorgeous. I love it. <laughs> I am going to turn my screen around again. Um I remember how. Um, yeah, there we go. So now you can see me again. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. I really, really love talking to you. I think it's so interesting and I really admire all the different things that you're doing and how you bring it all together and it sounds like you must have a really busy life, but luckily there's a lot of things that you do with people together as well. You don't do it all by yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not at all, not at all. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'll make sure that I link to all of these things, your podcast, your radio, your uh, website, all these things. I will link to all of it in the show notes and, of course, to um, our beautiful model as well and to the photographer of, uh, of the photo as well. I'll link to all of that on the and do you want to hold up your drawing one more time? Just to, uh, yeah, I'll send over a photograph of it as well. My little, my little pattern that I've made. I think it looks fantastic. It's uh, it's so interesting that we both look at the same picture and we 
captured really different sort of elements. Yeah. Of uh, very unique to both of us, which I think uh, is really lovely. Um, is there anything you want to plug or that I'm forgetting? For, uh... I guess just if you're interested in finding more of the girl bands, working with us, we're always open for collaborations with anyone. We're based in Liverpool, but we're always open for national, international connections too. Mm -hmm. You can find us on Instagram at where are the girl bands or send us an email at where are the girl bands at gmail.com. And you can find me on Instagram at Ella Fradge, which is E double L A F R A D G E. Um, if you just want to have a chat, talk about anything, or um, yeah, get to know more about my illustration and poetry practices. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I'm sure that uh, we'll hear much more about you. It's, yeah, it's been so much fun talking to you as well. So yeah, thank you. Amazing. Mm -hmm.